This is a video summary of sections 11.2 and 11.3 from the Science 9 textbook from Mrs. James's class. This material is covered in the second checkpoint for the chapter. There's two checkpoints for this chapter. And this one deals with Newton's third law of motion and also just kind of some miscellaneous ideas. This is the way that the students have learned Newton's third law of motion in the past, which is not correct. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I gave them some pretty basic examples. If I throw a bouncy ball at a semi-truck, there's not going to be an equal and opposite reaction. They're not going to both go flying backwards through the air. If I jump up in the air, the earth pulls me back down. I don't pull the earth up to meet me. So the reaction and the action are not necessarily equal and opposite. And we discussed that with this slide and came up with a couple different examples. So what is it that's the same? What is equal and opposite? And that's the forces involved. For every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. So when I ask the students to uh, give me Newton's third law of motion on the test, this is what I'm expecting them to write with the word force inserted. So if I throw a bouncy ball at a truck, the bouncy ball is pushing on the truck, and the truck is pushing back on the bouncy ball with the same amount of force, the same number of newtons. If um, I jump up in the air, gravity pulls me back down, if the earth is pulling on me, I'm pulling on the earth with the same amount of force, the same amount of newtons. The force is the same, the action and the reaction aren't. Why aren't they the same? Why does the bouncy ball go flying backwards and not the semi-truck? Well, in that particular example, it has to do with mass. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's based on ideas we'll get to later in the chapter. So um, the students need to keep in mind that objects have different mass, they have different momentums when they encounter each other, therefore they can react differently to the same amount of force. This, by the way, goes against their common sense. If I tell them that a car runs into a butterfly, they really want to believe that the car is hitting the butterfly harder than the butterfly is hitting the car. It is the same amount of force, though. Um, they're used to the idea of push, meaning a shove. So when I lean against the wall, I have my hand resting on the wall, I'm pushing on the wall, and the wall is pushing back on me. It doesn't have to do anything to push back on me, it just is. And we gave a couple examples of this. The kid throws away a bottle into the trash can, the kid's hand is pushing on the bottle, the bottle's pushing back on the hand. When the bottle goes into the trash can, it pushes on the bottom of the trash can, the trash can pushes back up. Same amount of force. Elephant balances on a ch uh, chair on its trunk. The chair is pushing down on the elephant. The elephant's pushing back on the chair. The amount of force is the same. We then moved on to look at some of the miscellaneous material. Uh, 8.2, I believe some of this material is also in 8. Point, uh, I'm sorry, 11.2. I think some of it's also in 11.3. Started by talking about the four different kinds of forces: gravity, electromagnetic, the strong, and the weak nuclear force. We are going to talk about the strong and the weak nuclear force a little bit in Chapter 5 and also in Chapter 9, but certainly not in this chapter. Electromagnetic force is going to be very important in Chapter 5. The one we're going to focus on in this chapter is force of gravity. These are naturally occurring forces. If I want to move a chair, I have to have contact with it. So I can put my hand on the chair, I can push it, or I can pull it. The Earth exerts the force of gravity on me even when it's not in contact with me. Uh, the protons and the electrons in my body for electromagnetic force exert a force on each other even when they're not in contact. So these are the four natural forces that happen in the universe. Of these forces, gravity is the weakest. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of review from junior high. Gravity causes all objects on Earth to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. So something is falling freely and we can ignore air friction. That's the value of the acceleration. Students need to memorize this number, not just for this chapter, but for chapters to come. They're going to need to know that. We often designate that value with a small, or I should say a lowercase, italicized g. Also talked about the universal law of gravitation. All objects in the universe attract each other. That's the simplest way to say it. So it's not just the Earth that's pulling on you. You're pulling on the Earth. The sun's pulling on you, too, and you're pulling on the sun. Neptune is pulling on you, and you're pulling on Neptune. I told the students that each of them was pulling on the chalk in my room, and my chalk is pulling on them. But the Earth is the large thing that's close to us. 
and that force of gravity is so strong that any of those other forces really become negligible. Students do not need to mem memorize this equation, but I wanted uh, them to see it. The force of gravity is equal to, this big G is a constant, which means it's always the same value in the same units, the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object divided between the distance between them squared. So as the masses of the objects involved get bigger, the gravity gets bigger. As the distance between them gets bigger, the gravity gets smaller. This is really common sense. Most of the students know this and are aware of this. We then went on, we opened up a website that showed um, what the student's weight would be on other planets, taking this into account. Uh, different planets have different masses. Um, we set this up by talking about mass and weight and how the two are different. Mass and weight do not mean the same thing, although we often use them in the same way. Weight is the force of an object, the force on an object due to gravity. So if you're standing on a planet, how hard is that planet pulling on you? That's your weight. If you're on a planet with a different mass, your weight's going to be different. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. That's not going to change. So my mass stays the same unless I grow taller or I get wider or I get thinner. My mass isn't going to change. But my weight's going to be based on the location where I am. And then here's that website that we brought up, and it let the students see what their weight what might be if they went and stood on another planet. So that was just kind of fun, but just wanted to reinforce the idea. Talked a little bit about projectile motion. This is also in the book. Encourage students, if they haven't read Chapter 11, Section 2s and 3s, to do so. We have been talking so far about objects that only have a horizontal component to their velocity. Projectile motion has got a horizontal and vertical components. And this is when an object is thrown or launched. So uh, I give them examples of throwing something and then of pushing something off a table. Those both would have projectile motion. The new thing for students is the idea that the horizontal velocity and the vertical velocity have nothing to do with each other. If you launch or you throw an object or you push it off a table or you shoot it out of a cannon, the horizontal velocity is constant. So it doesn't speed up or slow down, it just goes straight in that direction. It does slow down in the vertical direction based on gravity and then speeds up based on gravity. So if you look purely vertically, it's going slower and slower and slower and faster and faster and faster. But while that's happening, this velocity is staying constant. So it doesn't matter how quickly you launch something or you throw it, as long as it's in a straight line, it has no effect on the vertical component. So again, we were face, uh, focusing mainly on, on objects that are launched straight out. So for instance, um, something that's shot out of a gun. Sorry, that's not a very straight line. It should be something that's shot out of a gun or pushed off a table or launched out of a cannon that goes straight. That's no better. And then it curves down. We talked about it doesn't matter how fast you launch it. It's still accelerating downwards at 9.8 meters per second. So it doesn't matter, for instance, if uh, you shoot something out of a gun or if you drop it from a gun. Let's say we have a cannonball. If we launch it straight out of a cannon or we drop the cannonball, they're going to hit the ground at the same time. Uh, this was a little hard for a lot of the stu students to stomach. Um, this is uh, really, we had a fun clip on this that I'll get to later. The um, Mythbusters actually did an episode on this uh, last year where the myth, they weren't trying to prove or disprove this as a myth, they went into this acknowledging this is true, the physics is really solid, this, this, this is true, this is how it is. Uh, but the Mythbusters approach was, is can we design equipment to actually demonstrate this happening? So we watched that clip also. And um, if the students do a search on uh, Mythbusters dropped bullet, they can uh, watch this again at home if they want to. Last thing that I want to wrap up with here is the idea of Newton's first law of motion. Second, second law, and third law. Students need to be prepared to start with 
stating all three of these laws. So they're going to have three written responses where they should expect to have to tell me Newton's first law of motion, second law of motion, and third law of motion, the way we learned them in class. And then they also need to be prepared to give me an example of each of these. In the previous video summary, I went into detail on that in Newton's first and second law of motion. I want to talk about that a little bit here with Newton's third law of motion. Um, Newton's third law of motion is the easiest one to give an example of because you don't actually have to talk about the motion. All you have to talk about is the forces involved. So let's go back to the slide that's got Newton's first, a third law of motion written on it. For every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. So here's an example. Let's go back to our bouncy ball. I throw the bouncy ball and hit the truck with it. The bouncy ball is pushing on the truck, and the truck is pushing back with the same amount of force. An example in the kitchen. I um, press the knife against the cutting board. The cutting board is pressing back against the knife with the same force. I put a pan on the stove. The stove is pushing on the pan, and the pan is pushing back with the same amount of force. That's really all there is to it. I can give them a variety of different situations, and they just have to come up with an example where they're showing me they understand that the force is returned. It could be a push, it could be a pull, with the same amount of force. Um, I pull on the cupboard door to open it. The cupboard door pulls back on my hand with the same amount of force. That would be an example from the kitchen. Well, what if I asked them for an example um, from the playground? I pull back on a swing, and the swing pulls back with the same amount of force. What about if I ask for an example in the hallway? I pull on my locker door to open it, and the locker door pulls back with the same amount of force.